Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School World Order. I am your host, the Taoist Professor John Kleisick, author of School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. And today, I'd like to take a look at the prospects of community schools in the Biden administration. Okay, so what is a community school? It has three main components. It's going to provide something called wraparound services, or otherwise known as pipeline services. And these are going to be delivered through public private partnerships. So, in other words, community schools re require an element of privatization, of corporatization. What this means is a community school must partner with private companies to provide wraparound services such as in the broad spectrum of healthcare, workforce training, and criminal justice. There's also a data tracking or data analysis component. And then there's a lifelong learning component, which is a term that comes out of the United Nations, UNESCO. Basically what this means is that in addition to wraparound services, it's going to provide these services not just for traditionally school-aged students, so K through 12th grade and then I guess college as well. It's going to also provide daycare services, elder care services. It's going to also provide community service volunteering programs and then also general recreational services. So parks and recreation stuff, basketball court, maybe a theater or something like that. Okay. So community school has to have these three things. In the actual school building, you have your academics, your traditional academics, meaning you know your three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, arts, sciences, all the stuff that you would traditionally expect to learn at a school academic skills or concepts okay but that has to be supplemented with healthcare, workforce training and criminal justice services that are going to be provided by a private company okay it's going to be some data tracking and analysis at this point that means digital because all data tracking at this point is digital although community schooling is a concept that goes back to at least the 70s and Data analysis has always been a component, even prior to the, the modern microprocessor computer. Okay, but today this means basically there's going to be a big tech element that's going to track not just data pertaining to what the students are learning, but also data in terms of right the students' health, the students' job competences, and then how at risk are they to end up in the jail system. And so, based on that data, then. It's kind of like a feedback loop and it's going to feed back into all this is going to go in here and then this is going to, it's going to be pumped back into the overarching administration so that they can then refine all these other services. And those services, right, aren't just going to be for youth, but it's going to be for everybody, basically cradle to grade. Okay, so this is what a community school is. I want to emphasize, right, the, the corporate part. Um, some community schools might actually still have like an at-home or virtual online component, especially moving forward, as it looks like there's no end to the lockdown currently inside. Okay, so in other words, all this academic stuff, you're going to learn it through your online module at home. And you'll only go to the community school center, that building, in order to get some hands-on job training. Maybe you have to do a lab. Maybe you need to get some dental care or some counseling. And also there will be a police station there for really risk intervention. Okay, but, but the building is only largely to house the wraparound services and the pipeline services. That's the term that's used in Every Student Succeeds Act, which determines that if a community school wants federal funding to be a full service community school, it has to have these wraparound or pipeline services. But these are going to be housed in the actual building. And then most of the learning 
in the future, the model is to have that done on the computer at home. And the, the, this model is, is the model that was designed at the beginning of the Good Lad study. And I, I'll show you in a place called school, but right, it lays out just this, okay, including the public private partnerships, the corporate and business partnerships for workforce training. Okay, so let's just for a second, maybe somebody at home is thinking this, well, it looks maybe like a good idea because the students are going to have all this extra help. It's integrating all these other helpful services, but all those positive things aside, what happens when you blur all of it together and it's all under the same jurisdiction, the same funding, and it's all basically in lockstep with the prospectus and the quotas of this big tech data mine. Well, what that means is we can pathologize the academics. So the mental health services getting too involved in the learning and maybe want to pathologize particular ideas that a student has or pathologize a person's literacy or numeracy levels and suggest that this student doesn't just need maybe some remediation or some extra tutoring, but that student needs mental health counseling or maybe even uh, mental health medication. Same thing with, with the criminal justice element. Not only can we pathologize it, we could maybe criminalize it, right? We could criminalize certain behavior. I wrote an article about how the problems with uneven or unequal policing of behavior on a racial basis, how that problem will likely be exploited in order to do exactly what I'm saying, which is combine mental health, not just with academics, but with the criminal justice system, meaning if we pathologize the students' skill levels academically and we associate that with criminal risk, then we could have a criminal punishment in line with the student if he or she uh, doesn't respond properly to the mental health interventions. Okay, and then you can add the same thing to the workforce, right? Um, is, is a student's lack of workforce competence a mental health issue that could lead to delinquency and then some sort of criminal outbursts. But the idea here is that all of these interests sort of get blurred together from a central planning situation directed by this data, right? And so even while the student is at home, their module is going to data mine what they're learning here. And then that data is going to get sent back to these other departments of the community school. And then based on that data, they might need to intervene. And that won't just happen at home during the school years, but all the way to to the end of life care, okay? And so uh, that is the pernicious danger of a community school, right? What, how, however that package might seem to be appealing, it's easily and readily abused, not just by corporate interests, these corporate interests who have largely commandeered the public system through their wraparound services, but also through not just corporations in general, but big tech specifically, and then obviously uh, the big government instruments of the state that basically perch on top of that and feed off of that system. Okay. So let's let's unpack some of the models would have been in the 80s uh, and also the 90s as well. The stuff comes out of uh, something called total quality management or TQM. And if we take a look at a flow chart here from Total Quality Learning Incorporated. Uh, trade uh, copyright now, this is early 90s, I changed to Total Quality Learning Incorporated. This is kind of similar to the model that I drew on the whiteboard, some of the, the flow or the principle of the cyclical feedback between institutions into the human resources or the human capital that is the students and the parents. That's pretty much the same, or the principle is the same. Okay, so you'll see that consumers are considered the community here. And so uh, the community or the consumer, if you look here, are the, both the internal and external. So the internal is the students. They are the products themselves. And the external would be members of these other institutions that are going to provide, I guess, the wraparound services. But also, eventually, the, the, the consumers here, which are also the suppliers, will take on these roles. And based on that interplay here, there'll be consumer research. Oh, this is the data mining function, looking at right how well was the student able to function in these different roles, meaning, right, did the information or the learning management that we put into the supply chain here, did that come out in the proper 
way that we wanted in terms of economic outcomes. So did these educational outcomes, or did they turn into economic outcomes based on the data we get from that, it will feed back into the overall management system, which will then make an adjustment and then pump this revised curriculum, this revised career pathways, workforce training, social credit data back into the system and reshape the parents and their children who are the products, the human resources, human capital, to recalibrate them to go back into the system and the next generation to recalibrate again. Just kind of continue this cyclical self-perpetuating process geared towards right a planned economy. Another flow chart that kind of illustrates the same thing based on community education model here. So before I break down this community school flow chart, I want to provide you the citation and some of the background context. So this is a photocopy from Charlotte Thompson Isserby, who worked at the Department of Education under Ronald Reagan in the Office of Educational Research and Improvement, blew the whistle on Project Best. She gave me this. I got to go through her archives. And this model is photocopied from an excerpt from page 52 of a position paper entitled Learning and Instruction in Chicago Inner City Schools Prepared for the Planning Staff of the Chicago Public Schools at the request of Dr. Donald J. Liu, William W. Farquhar, and Lee S. Schulman, Michigan State University and Chicago Public Schools Committee. Also included Evelyn Carlson, Associate Superintendent, Laura Ward, Chairman, Sophie Bloom, which I believe is Benjamin Bloom's wife, Angeline Caruso, Matt Nair Grant, Audrey Lerner, June 1968. So this is one of the earliest models of a community school. This particular implementation resulted in almost half of 39,500 students failing to graduate in a 1980 freshman class. It was a mastery learning project which covered not only academic, but effective social and values education. So mental health conditioning, essentially using community as a resource. There's a community school structure, school-based management. There's the corporatization of public-private partnerships, community service, again, communitarian lifelong learning and non-grading, which means a performance-based assessments, which means psychometric and biometric conditioning or data mining of students performance. So it says the last paragraph of the paper reads, the future of Chicago rests upon the ability of its schools to fuse the needs of today with the demands of tomorrow. We will be successful in confronting this challenge if we can effectively develop a coordinated program within which pupils, instructional personnel, members of the community, and institutions of higher education work jointly for the achievement of intellectual mastery, there's a mastery learning language, the development of social responsibility, and the reconstruction of the life of the city. So urban planning, combining communitarian rhetoric with TQM, total quality management of the political economic system, in particular the city. So it says references used in the paper include Benjamin Bloom, and another here is Robert Glazer, who was one of the pioneers of programmed instruction, sort of ran with B.F. Skinner's ideas. Okay, so let's now let's break down the flow chart itself. And so, all right, this is the input phase. This is sort of the machinery that makes some sort of a change. Then here's the output phase. You have three layers to the teachers and students and then the community at large, which would be, I guess, the other wraparound services and the other uh, companies and institutions plug into the large society. They get fed into this machinery, outcome-based educational slash mastery learning pedagogy. By the way, OBE does actually have implementation separately in business management, which do relate to total quality management, something else called PPBS, which is programming, planning, and budgeting systems. Okay. So the, the teachers come in and they are shaped by the pedagogy, by the curriculum, but then they deliver it through the instruction into the students and the community at large all of which come out the other end with reshaped values, reshaped skills that are geared towards the docile acquiescence to their workforce functions. Okay, and I should also note here the 
the analogs are the parallels to the computing language or the program instruction language, so input, output, in terms of like data, input, data, output, calculations, which, which has an analog in stimulus response or operant conditions. So input, particular stimulus, and output is the response, and if you program it uh, properly with the correct algorithms on the correct schedule, it can reshape the, the raw materials of human beings into the desired workforce drones. Now let's take a look at total quality management in uh, school system here. Okay, this is from the Association for Supervision Curriculum Development, 1993, volume 35, issue number two. And this doesn't really use the communitarian community school rhetoric so much. But if you look at it, you'll see that much of the language does parallel the, the language of the school system. But you'll see an emphasis on data, right? Data analysis, as I've demonstrated in, throughout this presentation, it's key to community schools, but also that the TQM flowchart I just showed you. And I'll say more about data here. Notice the emphasis on outcomes. So that means that's a reference to outcomes based pedagogy which has its roots in what is called mastery learning, which has its roots in behaviorist, psychological conditioning pedagogy, the Skinnerian stuff. Here's, if you see, mastery, you can see the mastery learning language. Okay, more on monitoring and data. Data, all about data analysis. Okay, notice here, We've got more emphasis on measurement, measuring data, empirical stuff, but here we're focusing on effective factors such as self-esteem. So there's your social emotional learning. There's your, there's your wraparound service, your mental health-based wraparound service. And it's essentially all workforce-based. And so mastery learning or outcomes-based, in other words, Skinnerian style psychological conditioning, which finds its ultimate expression in adaptive learning software or program instruction, which is all the big tech stuff that's going to plug into the data analysis, which it emphasizes throughout here, and then also performance based. And the performance based, that means personalization by providing modules, AR, VR, or other performance based modules that are tailored to the students' biometrics and psychometrics through the analysis of effective data, social emotional learning data, and other psychometrics that will be serviced through the public, private, corporate wraparound services. Okay. All right, now let's look what happens when you take TQM and you use the principles of community schooling in partnership with a big tech company like IBM. <clears throat> to create an education village. Let's see what you get. Now, according to Charlotte's note here, this is from the Charlotte Observer, January 27th, 1996, okay? And the title here is uh, Education Village Causes a Stir, and it's all about this IBM grant. All right, so we have here not a education community, not a community school, but a village school, an educational village, which is basically a public-private partnership between IBM and this workforce training school. So TQM style policies with a workforce training wraparound service that will funnel the students into high-tech jobs, in particular IBM specifically. You'll see here the location, literally in the shadow of IBM's manufacturing plant, in University Research Park. And then you'll also see down here, it's referred to as a workplace magnet, workplace magnet school. So the idea of a workplace magnet is to form an expensive new partnership between the school and nearby high-tech company, attracting business volunteers to spend significant amounts of time in the school as mentors. So then the business volunteers go into the schools and they're going to teach the, the kids to be good corporate citizens and to join the IBM team here. So this is $2 million in the 90s, which in terms of inflation, is, uh, that's a decent amount of money. Notice here we've got multi-age classroom. Kids progress at their own pace. So kind of the lifelong learning. We're talking 
competency-based, performance-based, which is always best facilitated through automated means. Connect the schools and the home. So pulling the home into the community sphere, which is now a corporate sphere managed by IBM, at least in this model. And then you've got a lot of money here that goes for teacher training. So to make sure that the teachers Going back to that other model I showed you with the input-output, it's not just the students that we want to reshape and recondition as human capital for our corporate technocracy. We want to make sure we, we have to remold the teachers as well so that they will be proper managers, proper facilitators of the corporate hierarchy. Okay, okay so this is, this is in the 90s. Let's go ahead and jump to the current state of affairs. Take a look at IBM Community School. City! partners with IBM on new STEM program in community. And the quote here from the city's chief education officer, Otis Agni is, we're very excited to work with IBM to bring this program into community schools. Community schools are public schools in which city support strategic partnerships to meet student and community needs, including extracurricular activities and job readiness training. Right? Everything I've said, and look who's partnering with them, it's IBM. And it looks pretty much like the same thing I just showed you, although, as I mentioned, right, I didn't call it a community school, and the other package, but just change the name, change the label, and that's the main thing that's changing here. It's not really the operation. Okay, and then here's another one. Let's take a look. This is on IBM's website. The other one was philadelphia.gov, so that was a government website. Okay, so, so this is like a bulletin or a press release from IBM on a STEM camp that they have facilitated, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics camp. But it partners with Dubuque Community Schools, right? So that would be an example of a workforce training wraparound service, okay? But so IBM has got its hands all over community schools. And so this is just another example to show you that community schools are public-private, corporatist partnerships with big tech, because remember the data tracking and the data analysis is an essential component to any community school. Okay, okay so now one more example of how Community schools are public-private partnerships. Here is an example of a community school that's referred to as an effective school. Effective school community partnerships. That's another euphemism for essential schools and for community schools broadly. But I'm going to show you some old literature that I scrounged up from Charlotte's archives that show you that effective schools are basically just another basket of essential schools slash community schools. Etc. Okay, but but one way to illustrate that is just to show you that part of the New York State Community Schools Technical Assistance Centers is they have the nine elements of effective school community partnerships, and it's all about with mental health, physical health, oral wellness. In other words, they're illustrating that it's clearly a community school based on wraparound services. Just thought this would be useful to show before I start showing you the effective school literature that right, it's explicitly tied to the community school model, which involves, as you see here, public-private partnerships in mental health and healthcare more broadly, okay? The Effective Schools Report. So this one in particular, we have the Monsanto Effective Schools Project. Okay, so, so this was in the stack of the Effective School Report documents that Charlotte had. Now, I don't have the actual, I have the volume number and the issue number here. The way it, the way it came out of the filing cabinet, I, I don't have the, uh, I don't know which year or month it is. Okay, it's clearly sometime after 1984 at the earliest. Uh, when I, I was in that stack, if you look at the font for the actual effective school report, it leads me to believe that this is also the effective school report, okay? It's just in the effective school project for this Monsanto partnership in, in the uh, business and education cooperative. So I'm, I can't guarantee that's what this is from the effective schools report, that specific publication, but it is in the line of effective school pedagogy, which is a community school pedagogy, but I just want to make that clear. I don't have the precise citation for this document, but here's your author, Marcy Wolfram, project coordinator. I guess you could write the effective schools report and uh, ask them for this article, or if you find her, you ask her about it. 
But let's just look at it, what she's writing about here, okay? It's a public-private partnership. The Monsanto company, yes, the chemical company, the same one that was responsible for Agent Orange, Aspartame, DDT, a Roundup, all of that stuff, all those wonderful chemicals that never did anything bad to anybody, it never harmed anybody at all. This company is going to, they're the type of company you want teaching your kids. They're the type of company you want partnering with your your teachers i want you to look at the language here this is basically like equity language like this racial equity language that is being co-opted by neoliberal agendas and so if you look at this article they're largely pitching it as look we're servicing the black community in a very impoverished area where the housing stock is bad etc right so basically they were saying these black kids are in, in a lot of need for help and monsanto is providing it because they love everybody so much and so what are they going to help them with well let's look i want you to know look here's the communitarian language okay and the effective schools report it's about community schools okay more communitarian language here now look what's underneath the communitarian language what are they concerned about for helping these black kids behavior standards behavior standards and look, assertive discipline. So what are they presuming? Are they presuming racist stuff about how black kids behave? And their emphasis is on not, it's not on academics, it's on managing these kids' behavior in order to discipline them better. So in the modern era, the equity language is now being promoted to try to replace traditional policing with mental health and so with all the police brutality stuff people are going to feel a lot better about the idea of a counselor coming and having a therapeutic discussion with them as opposed to like an armed guard or something but but note here that look at the type of companies behind this stuff and they're going to be data mining the students to find at-risk algorithms or other algorithms that indicate the student needs discipline, they're going to take that data to mandate behavioral interventions, behavioral therapies, and then, you know, if the student doesn't demonstrate the proper turnaround for that intervention, that mental health intervention, then the, the policing stuff will come later. But in the meantime, if you think about a company like Monsanto, a chemical company like Monsanto, which is now partnered with Bayer, which is a pharmaceutical company, this opens up the prospects for maybe that the student based on whatever algorithms, biometric, psychometric on their adaptive learning modules, their performance-based modules says that this student, they've got some mental issues and, you know, they might be a danger. So they need to take some, some mental health medication, some, some pharmaceutical drugs. Okay. So I've shown you a basic model of community schooling in general, and then I showed you two examples of specific community schools that are managed by public-private partnerships with giant multinational corporations, in particular, IBM and here Monsanto, IBM's Education Village and Monsanto's Effective School. So a nice way to wrap up here is to emphasize that not only are community schools public-private partnerships with large corporations, despite their communitarian rhetoric, despite the racial justice rhetoric of this Monsanto Effective Schools report, and despite some of the social justice rhetoric provided by IBM's community schooling, these two companies are some of the most racist and unjust companies that have ever existed in the history of humanity. And to provide an example of what I mean, to show you that it's not just hyperbole, let's take a look at the Vandana Shiva's article in Global Research. And then I'll show you two books by award-winning journalist Edwin Black. And I'll document for you the history of how both of these companies, IBM and Monsanto, had business partnerships with the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler. Okay, so this is a 2016 article by Dr. Vandana Shiva, longtime activist against Monsanto. In particular, their production of GMOs and everything that goes along with that. And the article here is titled, Monsanto Merges with Bayer, Their Expertise in Forest Shady Historical Origins of IG Farben, Part of Hitler's Chemical Genetic Engineering Cartel. 
Okay, so what she documents here is that the relatively recent merger of Monsanto and Bayer was actually a reunion of the two corporations that used to exist together in a partnership called Mobe that was part of the IG Farben chemical cartel, which was the Nazi chemical company that was responsible for developing Zyklon B gas, which was used for eugenic extermination in the concentration camps. So Monsanto, which wants to provide a community school that's purportedly going to help poor black kids for racial justice and racial equity, the same company, Monsanto, was part of the IG Farben cartel, which was responsible for racial genocide, eugenic holocaust under the Nazi regime. Okay, so we might want to be skeptical of the communitarian rhetoric being used by a literal fascist corporation. Now let's also take a look at how IBM also did business with Hitler to carry out eugenic experimentations in Nazi concentration camps. So this is a book by award-winning journalist Edwin Black. The title is IBM and the Holocaust, and he documents how IBM did business with Hitler in order to help him process all of the data that came out of the concentration camps. If you're not aware, the concentration camps were not just used to exterminate Jewish people, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, communists, and others. It was also used to carry out eugenic experimentations on the people in those concentration camps. So sometimes they might just work somebody to death if they didn't just want to outright do the Zonderbehandlung treatment, which means special treatment, which meant just bullet to the head or other form of execution. They would try to get some labor out of the people or they would try to get some data out of the people. And so what they would do is they would run eugenic experimentations on the concentration camp prisoners. And in order to process all of that data, you needed what was the equivalent of the modern computer at the time. That was the IBM punch card system because they didn't have digital computers at the time. And so IBM helped to process that data. It gave them the punch card machinery, but it didn't just give them the hardware. They leased the equipment. And in order for the data to be processed, it had to be sent back to the headquarters in the United States of America. So the headquarters of IBM in America were aware of what was going on in those camps and they profited from it. And you can read all about it in this book. They have two companies that carried out operations for Hitler's eugenic concentration camps using communitarian rhetoric to provide schools that are somehow going to help with racial equity or social justice through big data. What I see here is a flip of the old eugenic rhetoric. So Edwin Black also wrote another book that's called War Against the Weak. And it's all about all the other companies that did business with Hitler in addition to IBM to advance eugenic selection and eugenic engineering, which today we would call genetic engineering. But the title here sort of encapsulates the rhetoric that was used by the old school eugenicists. And that was that it was somehow a duty of theirs to get rid of the so-called undesirables or the so-called unfit genetic specimens of the human populations in order to weed out all that bad stuff so that human beings could evolve into the ubermensch or the superman. And so they basically had a war against all of these weak or defective genotypes. Well, that didn't work out very well for them. And eugenics became a four letter word. And all those old eugenics organizations like the American Eugenics Society and the British Eugenics Society, they changed their names and they still exist under different rhetoric. And the rhetoric has changed now to instead of we're going to exterminate and target these unfit or undesirables, we're going to help them. We're not going to remove them from the gene pool or from the genetic sweepstakes of reproduction. We're going to help re-engineer their biology, re-engineer their biometrics and their psychometrics so that they can be useful to society, so that they can become part of the corporate technological evolution of the human species. And so the community school becomes an instrument through which big data can be used to track and trace all of the students' biometrics and psychometrics in order to reshape the student into a useful human resource that can be used as human capital in the coming transhumanist, internet of things, internet of bodies, technocracy.
Now, if you think that sounds far-fetched or if you think that I'm somehow conflating the eugenic history of these companies with their involvement in the modern community schooling movement, let's take a look at John Goodlatte, whose 1979 study of schooling resulted in four seminal community schooling books that became the manuals for disseminating community schooling structures and pedagogies throughout the 80s and 90s. Okay, so I've got Charlotte Thompson Isra Beach Deliberate Dumbing Down of America here. On page 81, she has an excerpt from a 1968 article by John Goodlad. So this is basically 10 years before he was commissioned to complete his study of schooling, which resulted in the community schooling manuals that were used to disseminate community schools throughout the 80s and 90s. So this article titled Learning and Teaching in the Future appeared in the National Education Association's journal, which is titled Today's Education. So here's the quote. The most controversial issues of the 21st century will pertain to the ends and means of modifying human behavior and who shall determine them. The first educational question will not be what knowledge is of the most worth, but what kind of human beings do we wish to produce? The possibilities virtually defy our imagination. So that sounds pretty eugenical to me. Notice that John Goodlad, one of the pioneers of community education, is telling you that the goal of schooling in the 21st century will not be what types of knowledge students learn, but what types of human beings we can engineer through the schooling process. This is not only social engineering, but I would call it biopsychosocial engineering. In other words, engineering of the total human being, the ethos, logos, and pathos of the human spirit, the, the will, the mind, and the emotions of the human being through big data, through big tech, aggregating all the students' biometrics and psychometrics, their cognitive behavioral data, their psychoaffective data, their social emotional learning data. You're going to take all of that. And they're going to run it through this community schooling corporate government apparatus in order to make sure that they can re-engineer students to fit into the corporate hierarchy. Now, if you still think I'm equivocating the correlations between community schools, eugenics, and big data corporations like IBM, let's finish up here by taking a look at IBM's artificial intelligence system, its network of AI bots known as Watson. So you'll see here it says Watson is AI for business. And then if you scroll down, it says IBM's website, the Watson page. And you'll see here that Watson conducts AI analytics for finance, for healthcare, and also for security. So finance and business being the workforce training wraparound service, healthcare being obviously the healthcare wraparound service, and then security being the criminal justice wraparound service. So IBM's Watson, which is its artificial intelligence platform, provides data analytics for all three of the wraparound services that will plug into a community school. Now, why is it called Watson? Well, let's take a look and see whom it is named after. And take a look at this Atlantic article titled Hitler's Willing Business Partners by Jack Beatty, April 2001. And just to cut to the chase, Thomas J. Watson, the founder of IBM International Business Machines. And here's the kicker, Thomas Watson chose to tabulate the Nazi census. Now that doesn't just mean tabulating the total population in Germany. It meant also tabulating the specific ethnic populations, in particular the population of Jewish people, but also populations of homosexuals, communists, Jehovah's Witness, and others that Hitler didn't like. And it also meant tabulating them to be removed and placed into concentration camps for eugenic experimentation, where IBM would then also tabulate that eugenic data. It says here he also accepted a medal directly from Hitler. So IBM's suite of artificial intelligence bots, which conduct analytics for finance, business, healthcare, criminal justice, all the wraparound services that would partner with the community school. This AI system, IBM has named it after its infamous CEO, Thomas J. Watson, 
who literally oversaw IBM's tabulating and processing of Hitler's eugenic concentration camp data. In other words, it appears that IBM is not ashamed of Thomas J. Watson. It's not a dirty skeleton in their dark closet that they want to push behind them and move away from into the future. They're celebrating it. They are celebrating this guy who is literally responsible for eugenic Holocaust and eugenic genocide. In fact, they're so proud of this guy that they decided to honor him by naming their artificial intelligence software after him. Okay, and so IBM's artificial intelligence suite known as Watson, not only does it provide AI analytics for workforce planning, healthcare, and criminal justice wraparound services, it literally also provides AI analytics for education. It provides learning analytics as well. And here you see that IBM Watson has a specific partnership with the Pearson Corporation, Pearson Education, which is literally the largest education corporation in the world, which has graduated from the printed textbook industry to the ed tech industry, the educational technology industry. And this is one of their main partnerships. Okay, and notice here that on this page of IBM's website, it is emphasizing how the Watson Pearson partnership services college students and educators. But if you go over to another IBM web page, you'll see that it also provides learning analytics for students at the preschool, kindergarten, and grade school levels. So let's take a look at the press release here. I actually cite this press release in my book, School World Order, and the title for this press release from IBM reads, IBM Watson and Sesame Workshop Introduce Intelligent Play and Learning Platform. And this press release was published on June 6, 2017. Okay, and then I can show you that this press release uses the communitarian rhetoric. Okay, and you'll see here that it says Sesame Workshop services, quote, vulnerable children through philanthropically funded social impact programs, each grounded in rigorous research and tailored to the needs and cultures of the communities we serve. In other words, these programs are community specific. But again, remember that the community stakeholders are not just the grassroots people on the ground who live there and pay taxes in that community. It's not just the students and teachers. It's also the corporate stakeholders. And those corporate stakeholders might be the ones that decide what those needs are for that particular community. Okay. And then notice here that the Gwinnett County Public Schools System, which partners with the Watson Sesame Workshop AI system, they're also invoking the communitarian rhetoric here, arguing that a supportive community is one of the key elements into the district's quest to become a system of world-class schools. And so you can see here that some of their community stakeholders include two corporate stakeholders, in particular, IBM and Sesame Workshop. And so how does this partnership between IBM and Sesame Street tailor their educational services to the particular needs of the specific communities in the Gwinnett County Public Schools system? Well, they are going to personalize the curriculums and the lessons based on the student's individual needs. And that's going to be determined by calculating data from the student's, quote, playful learning activities in order to, quote, adapt to each student's knowledge of a topic, interest, and approaches to learning. So notice here that we have the individualized or performance-based learning pedagogy being used in combination with data analytics. And we also have the adaptive learning language and adaptive learning is the modern term for the stimulus response psychological conditioning method of programmed instruction. And it's not just going to data mine the students' cognitive behavioral algorithms. In other words, their thinking algorithms. It's also going to data mine the students' social emotional algorithms. In other words, their feeling algorithms. So to sum up, IBM's artificial intelligence software, which is named after Hitler's partner in eugenics, Thomas J. Watson, is teamed up with Sesame Street to data mine students' learning analytics and mental health algorithms for the purposes of comprehensive biopsychosocial engineering of the student body. In other words, eugenic engineering. Okay, so I think I've made my case that corporatism and big data and even eugenic social engineering, all three go hand in hand with community schools. So if you'd like to learn more about the history of community schoolings and the future prospects of community schools under Joe Biden administration, 
take a look at my next installment in this video series. Thanks so much. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you'd like to check out more of my research, go to my website, schoolworldorder.info, where you can find archives of all my interviews, all my articles, and a bibliography of all my citations. There's also links to all my social media and video platforms, and you can sign up for my email list too where you will receive notifications whenever I produce a new article, interview, or video. To support my work, become a research member for just $5 a month, and you'll gain access to my WebBrain database, which contains Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's archive of US Department of Education files and other rare historical documents. The database will be updated with weekly document dumps, and you will be notified whenever I upload a new dossier. Thanks again for watching. Peace.